to lead our presentation, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Dr. Sapersky was lauded as office whisperer by the New York Times for helping leaders make the wisest decisions in the future of work. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts. He wrote seven best-selling books, and his newest one is called ChatGPT for Thought Leaders and Content Creators, Unlocking the Potential of Generative AI for Innovative and Effective Content Creation. Dr. Persky's cutting-edge thought leadership was featured in over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard, Harvard Business Review, Fortune, and Forbes. His expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting for Fortune 500 companies, from Athlap to Xerox, and over 15 years in academia as a behavioral scientist at UNC Chapel Hill and Ohio State University. I'm now pleased to turn for the webcast microphone to Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Connor. And welcome, everyone. So, talking about leveraging AI and transforming HR to drive success, that's what we'll be focusing on today. How to you can go from frustration to flourishing in mastering generative AI adoption as HR professionals, HR leaders, HR professionals at all levels. That's what we'll be focusing on. That's the shape of the presentation. Now, as Connor mentioned in the introduction, you can get a copy of my book on this topic, ChatGPT for Thought Leaders and Content Creators. You'll also get a number of other resources from this talk. Just make sure to go to the website you see under my name, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. It's also in the resources section, so you can just go there and click there, or you can put into your browser tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Okay, without further ado, let's talk about what we came here for. So, how you can go from frustration to flourishing. Talking about the overview. So, first, let's overview. What are your goals in generative AI adoption? First, you'll want to understand the kind of common challenges that I see all the time with clients who are trying to integrate generative AI. Then learn how to provide a safe environment for folks. I can guarantee to you a number of your folks are using generative AI already, even if you didn't provide official guidance in your company how to do so. And so you need to make a, this comfortable environment for those AI pioneers who might be using generative AI without official sanction. Then how to cultivate effective communication and get employee buy-in. So I want to think about that this is not for the pioneers, but for the rest of your staff, especially for a number who I can guarantee are worried about being replaced by generative AI. Then ensuring compliance and mitigating risks. So that's the fourth part of the presentation. Compliance, risk management, risk mitigation, that's a, is a really important goal for any HR professionals. And of course, we'll want to think about how to address those issues. And finally, the adoption strategy itself. So what steps do you take to enact a really comprehensive adoption strategy for generative AI? So that's the shape of the presentation. That's what you can expect. Now, let's talk about the benefits of generative AI first. So we know why we're actually doing this in the first place. I have a lot of clients who have seen it optimize workflows, who've seen it replace a number of workflows that were done manually with automated workflows, much better than other automation tools. Moreover, it will st support strategic business initiatives. So whatever business initiatives you want to take, whether it's digital transformation, whether it's recruiting, hiring, whether it's expansion, growth, efficiency, Generative AI can help you do all of that. Facilitating innovation and competitive advantage. Not many people think about generative AI as a tool for innovation. But 
generative AI is a really great tool for innovation. It's you might know that it has some problems with hallucination, but it's not a problem to hallucinate when you're trying to innovate because we all hallucinate when we're trying to brainstorm. So it's a very good tool for innovation. It's a very creative tool. So we'll talk about that. Boosting organizational performance more broadly. Whatever you want to focus on, whatever is the goal of the company, of your strategic plan, you can boost those aspects of your goal through generative AI, whether it's better teamwork, collaboration, return to office dynamics, you can facilitate all of that through generative AI. Enhancing functions and efficiency. So functions of various roles, you can enhance them in a variety of ways. Right now, digitally, of course, in the future, we will have increasing amounts of robotics, but we'll focus on digital and efficiency. So efficiency, you can make things much more efficient. You've probably heard in about a number of companies that stopped hiring people, fired some people, increase their payroll, uh, decrease their payroll, increase their output through generative AI. And it's true. You definitely can increase efficiency. What about within HR? So you saw that program that Sherm is offering. And here's what my clients have seen as benefits of integrating generative AI within HR. They streamlined recruitment processes and talent management. So talent management is within the company. So learning, professional development. Improving employee engagement and satisfaction. If you approach AI correctly, generative AI correctly, you will definitely improve employee engagement and satisfaction because you will remove a lot of low level tasks that people are really annoyed by anyway. And you'll have more data driven HR decision making, which is great because a lot of times HR professionals just have to go with their gut because they don't have data. But generative AI can provide you with a lot of data that you can use to make effective decisions. All right. So those are the benefits. Now, let's go to the, get part one, the common frustrations and challenges. Resistance to change. Resistance to change is a big one, associated primarily with fear of job displacement. So this is a big, big challenge I see from a lot of clients who are trying to integrate generative AI. Another is just lack of understanding and expertise. So there's lack of understanding a lot of managers don't want to integrate generative AI partially because they don't want to appear as noobs. They don't want to appear as unskilled in this area. And so this is a problem. So you really want to think about the learning culture and we'll focus quite a bit on creating a learning culture around generative AI. Integrating into existing systems. Generative AI is a quite new tool, comparatively speaking. I mean, chat GPT, came out and became popular in in October of 2022. So companies have not yet figured out many ways that I'll talk about, about how you can integrate it into your systems. Concerns over data privacy and security, and I'll definitely talk about that. That'll be part of four of the presentation. The perceived loss of the human touch. That is an issue I've heard about from a number of clients, especially with from HR, that there's this desire for H for a human touch. So people are concerned about that. Now, as part of these challenges, we run into cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are the ways that our brain is miswired. Our brain is not really wired for the modern environment. You probably have heard about that. And that's why we have a number of cognitive biases. We are actually wired for the ancestral savanna environment. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. So that is the environment that our brain is really wired for. And cognitive biases are the consequence of living with an ancestral savanna brain in the modern environment. Status quo bias is a great example. In the ancestral savanna, it was very dangerous for us when the situation changed because our survival was so precarious. If the situation changed in any significant way, it was likely to be a bad thing for us. The main thing that changed was the changing of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. 
in the modern environment, we have many, many more changes that are much more impactful and change our environment. Consider the rise of the smartphone, the rise of the internet, the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009, the pandemic, of course, the rise of hybrid and remote work, and the rise of generative AI, I mean, the rise of the internet earlier. They all fundamentally changed us. I remember when the internet came around, I remember you know, going and dialing up with AOL online with those sounds, e -oo -e, for those people who remember, you know, I'm, obviously I'm dating myself with that. So our brains are not really wired for new environments. And so we tend to be afraid of new things and we tend to prefer the status quo. And that is called the status quo bias because often a new situation is actually better for us. Taking advantage of a new situation is actually quite a bit better for us if we're willing to do it, but we're often not willing to do it. So the status quo bias is one of the cognitive biases that we need to overcome. So it's a preference for maintaining current practices and resistance to modifying established workflows. So this is a serious issue. So it causes people to be hesitant to experiment with solutions using generative AI. It, there is difficulty in accepting insights informed by generative AI. So solutions and insights, data and practices and flows, workflows, that is a challenge. So you want to make sure to overcome the status quo bias in your organizations. Be aware of it, take notes on this, think about where it will come up in your organization, where you have seen it come up elsewhere and how you can address it going forward in the field of generative AI. Another one, loss aversion. So in that savanna environment, we tended to have very few resources. And when we lost those resources, that was very dangerous. Because again, our survival was precarious. So we have an intuition to avoid losses, to avoid losing what we have, even if something new might be much better. So there's a fear of potential losses associated with generative AI that outweighs perceived gains. And there is a reluctance to invest time and resources of transition money into generative AI adoption because people don't want to lose them. And so there's an emphasis on negative outcomes, negative outcomes that might be associated with generative AI, especially concerns about generative AI replacing jobs. And so there's a resistance. A lot of the resistance comes from a perceived threat to employment that's from employees, rank and file staff. From managers, I've seen resistance come from this perception that they don't have these skills and they don't want to show themselves as lacking skills. So there's that loss aversion. So people are averse to losing that negative situations. They're averse to losing resources associated with generative AI adoption. And so you want to think about where in your company might loss adoption, might the loss aversion be an issue for integrating generative AI. And the final cognitive bias I want you to be cognizant of is empathy gap. Empathy gap. So you've heard of empathy, obviously. It's the ability to understand and care about other people's emotions. And empathy gap has to do with the fact that in the Savannah environment, we lived in small tribes, as I mentioned. And it was important for us to care about people like us and be hostile, not care, about people from other tribes. So we have an empathy gap toward those people who are different from us, who we don't perceive on some dimension to be part of our tribe. So we underestimate their emotional reactions. We think that, hey, they should be rational and logical about generative AI adoption, and we underestimate the extent of their emotions. We, un we don't feel nearly as much empathy toward them as we should, so we underestimate how they feel about generative AI. And many HR leaders and company managers, line operations managers, underestimate resistance to generative AI because of those employee feelings around status quo bias, loss aversion from employment and so on. So there's a real need 
to focus on providing appropriate emotional support to employees during the transition to integrating generative AI. And failing to address employee concerns empathetically is a serious, serious problem I've seen in a number of companies that we had to fix when we came in to address generative AI adoption. Another issue is that workplace relationships are going to be really changed by generative AI because the workflows are changed, impacted, shifted by generative AI. So there's a misjudgment of the emotions associated with changing these workplace relationships. And there's neglect of the need to provide adequate training, appropriate training and resources around using generative AI. So think about how the empathy gap might manifest in your organization as you're going forward to integrate generative AI. So what are the dangers of adopting generative AI without adequate support to address these common frustrations, challenges, cognitive biases? There's going to be increased anxiety and stress levels, which don't need to happen if you have adequate support. There's going to be reduced job satisfaction. I've seen this firsthand with surveys that companies ran after trying to integrate generative AI without adequate support. And then I'm coming in to see what's going on. And they're saying, hey, we're having anxiety, stress, reduced job satisfaction, definitely higher turnover rates. So that's the issue. Decreased motivation to participate in initiatives around generative AI and lower commitment to organizational grow goals and, or more broadly. So this is a serious issue. There's going to be reduced collaboration and teamwork. I've seen that. This is certainly an issue. And lower overall productivity and efficiency as a result. Even though generative AI will definitely increase your productivity and efficiency when you integrate it correctly, if you don't, you will see lower productivity and lower efficiency and increased error rates and tasks. You'll see reduced creativity and innovation, even though generative AI is a great tool for creativity and innovation and withdrawal from learning and development opportunities. Again, if you don't integrate generative AI effectively with adequate support. Now, what are the behavioral science strategies to address these problems? and to integrate generative AI effectively. You want to use positive reinforcement to encourage learning. We'll talk about that quite a bit about learning techniques, but thinking about positive reinforcement, that's really helpful. Use nudges to guide behavior changes. So create default options, create positive reinforcement, positive rewards for people to guide their behavior changes, nudging them, for people to make it easier for them to do the desirable behavior rather than forcing it top down. Create personalized learning paths. That's really important. Different employees, you'll have some people who are advanced generative AI users already, and you'll have others who are really behind. So you want to make sure to have personalized learning paths. Ensure psychological safety. There's gonna be a lot of failure when people start using generative AI. And they need to have psychological safety, which is the ability to fail at, in new tasks, in new areas, without any significant serious punishment. Because otherwise, why take on new tasks, which you'll inevitably fail in occasionally. Promote open communication and feedback. Employees are worried and anxious about generative AI. I can guarantee this to you. So you want to promote open communication and feedback around integrating generative AI. And foster a culture of empathy, of understanding, address this empathy gap, which is a very natural phenomenon. Okay, so these are the strategies that you want to use to address the common frustrations and challenges. Now, that's part one. Moving on to part two, how do you create a really safe learning environment for folks? You want to encourage risk-taking and experimentation. That is crucial to learning. Otherwise, how will people learn if they don't risk an experiment? Reduce the fear of failure, so provide that psychological safety for people to be able to fail without worrying too much about the consequence, and provide consistent support and feedback as people learn. OK, let's talk about some specific examples. So those were the generalities, the general framework, the 30,000-foot overview. Let me talk about some specific examples. 
One is peer mentoring as a successful learning initiatives. So again, I can guarantee to you, you already have some generative AI early adopters and you want to identify them, encourage them to come forward, facilitate knowledge sharing and skill development by pairing them with employees who are not early adopters of generative AI, but are willing to take it on. So you need to get those people who are early adopters to get to them to come up forward, reward them, say, hey, I know you've been using generative AI without official support. It's okay, come forward. We are welcoming you. We want you to be a peer mentor to others. And so get their best practices, see what worked well for them, and then assign them as peer mentors to others who want to learn about generative AI. And that way you also build stronger professional relationships, which is also nice. Let me tell you about a client of mine, a mid-sized tech company who did this. So the early adopter volunteers, they were volunteers as peer mentors and trainers. Again, we got them to come forward. We told them, it's fine that you were using generative AI. Come forward, tell us what you've been doing and you'll be peer mentors and trainers to others. So we, they covered different AI topics from coding, of course, with tech company, to content creation in the marketing division, to prompting. You, Of course, how do you actually prompt generative AI to provide the output that you want to get? And so that really enhanced collaboration and knowledge exchange across teams. So that was a really effective strategy, that peer mentoring. So you want to think about where in your company can you adopt peer mentoring as a strategy? Peer mentoring is a quite effective tool and you want to think about how are you going to get those generative AI early adopters to volunteer and put themselves forward and encourage them and reward them as part of the official evaluation, performance evaluation systems, of course. So the people on the mid-sized tech company that I mentioned, it was part of their performance evaluation to act as those peer mentors and trainers. So that was integrated as part of their performance evaluation. So think about doing that integration as part of creating the peer mentor relationships. Next, thinking about actually training. So I started with those early adopters. That is a really relatively easy thing to do because people are doing that already. I can guarantee to you some people in your company are doing that. Workshops are a little bit more difficult because you need to get trainers. So I provide training, others provide training. So you want to think about getting trainers who would actually train people on this generative AI best practices. So hands-on workshops and seminars. So workshops, seminars, in-person, virtual like this one, obviously. That provides in-depth training on various generative AI tools and technologies. Now, you might have heard about generative AI tools like OpenAI's ChatGPT, that is a very famous one. And right now their latest model is the GPT-4 Omni. It's a quite good model. It's one of the best, if not the best model. But the thing about that GPT-4 Omni is that it's best used by individuals. When you're using on a company level, you want to get the same version, GPT-4 Omni, available through Microsoft, through its Azure cloud. It's $20 per month per user. And what it does is that it enables you to have your company data completely safe and secure within the Microsoft cloud. It will not be used for any training. It will not be used for any other purposes. It will be held within your cloud and so within your own data processes that we, they won't be used for anything else. Also, you can get the your version of Copilot, which is the Microsoft's name for the GPT for the GPT-4 Omni. So it's Copilot. You can get it trained on your company data. And getting it trained on your company data is great because then it can give much more customized answers for you. So Microsoft, I, I don't have any affiliation with Microsoft. I do own some stock, but I also own Google stock. So Google also provides a very nice model called Gemini, Gemini 1.5 Pro. 
So that's a really nice model. So you can use that. It is a little bit less advanced currently than the GPT-4 Omni, which again, OpenAI provides. It's the same one as Microsoft uses. Anthropic Claude 3.5 Sonnet is also a very strong model, probably about maybe a little bit weaker, but it's, it's, it's a little bit stronger than the Gemini model and maybe about the same or maybe a little bit weaker than the GPT-4 Omni. So those are the main tools that you would be using. Those are the best. You should not be using anything else. And of course, those are chat tools. They will also do coding for you. They will also do image creation. They will also, you can use other tools for sound creation and video creation. So there are lots of other technologies and techniques which use those basic models as wrappers, essentially integrate with them and provide business enterprise services. And so you want to know about those tools and train your people on all of them. Encourage practical application of learned skills would be the next step. So you get people to learn, and then you see, OK, how can you apply those skills in their actual workflows? That's what you want to be thinking about. So get those trainings in, and then focus on practical application. I'll give an example from a regional insurance company that I worked with to help them integrate generative AI. So they held some regular workshops. I trained them on generative AI implementation where participants gained practical AI skills, which really improved their individual and team efficiency. I think their individual efficiency was improved by an average of something like 15% and team efficiency by something like 20% because you get team benefits so, and that's just the initial three months after going to the training. Of course, they're in, they keep increasing their ability as they keep learning more about generative AI and see how they can integrate generative AI into their workflows. So think about workshops and how you can apply that to your company. Next, micro learning. So we talked about workshops, those are broad, workshops, presentations for a number of people. Microlearning is much more customized. So after you have a workshop, microlearning is going to fill the gaps and get people to specialize in various areas of generative AI. So you break down, down those complex generative AI topics into short and focused lessons that people can go in depth. So these are gonna be going from the 101 of a workshop to a 201, to a 301, to a 401. So use videos, quizzes, and interactive content. Those are great micro-learning tools. And allow learning at an individual's own pace, whatever makes the most sense for them, for their needs. Let's talk about original financial services company in which I worked on developing some micro-learning. They offered, we offered micro-learning courses in generative AI, and we provide flexible learning paths, which were tailored to individual needs. And in fact, we use generative AI as a quiz tool. So generative AI trained on the company's information was used as a quiz tool to see, okay, what does this employee need to learn? And then the appropriate content from the micro learning various videos, quizzes, and so on was provided to these employees based on their needs. And that improved employee skills and productivity as a result of this. So we saw that within six months, individual employees, after going through this learning, improved their productivity by about 20% or so, which is great. I mean, that's a great improvement. So, so think about this micro learning and where you can integrate this. This is pretty easy to integrate. Again, after giving a broader workshop, to integrate this into your company, whatever your company's e-learning system is, so Blackboard or whatnot, whatever you're using, having some micro-learning content customized to your company's needs and based on your company's own data is very valuable. And finally, training gamification. So gamification is, of course, a way of rewarding people and incentivizing learning. So incorporating game elements like points and leaderboards, that combines very well with the micro learning. 
So again, giving we have those peer mentors, which takes that's the easiest thing to do because it takes immediate advantage of people who are already using generative AI within your company. Then going on to workshops, you have to organize those, takes a little bit more effort. Then micro learning. So I recommend whoever leads your workshops to create micro learning content. That's what I typically do. And then that micro learning goes into gamification. So around the micro learning, create gamification with points and leaderboards, badges and certifications for people who are getting skills and getting better in generative AI. And that's what will create competitive and collaborative learning experiences alike. So that's what really helps optimize learning for folks. Let me tell you about a large professional services firm with which I worked that integrated this tool of training gamification. It introduced gamified elements for generative AI skills, and that improved engagement and course completion rates. So that we definitely saw improvement in course completion and engagement after having these elements where people were recognized publicly for with certificates, badges, points, leaderboards for going through these micro learning courses. So increased retention and application of skills as a result. So think about training gamification, how you can integrate that into your company. Now, once you have, so those are examples of how to integrate learning. And you want to, of course, evaluate learning. So leverage data and analytics to, to learn how people learn. Track learning progress and outcomes through analytics. Use data to identify skills gaps and training needs. And that's where you can get those micro learning engaged quite effectively. You can also direct peer mentors to help address that. Then personalized learning experiences based on data insights. And you can use generative AI as a tool to personalize learning. I mentioned that. And continuously improve programs based on feedback and data. So that's how you leverage data and analytics for learning. And doing so, you'll promote continuous learning. So you'll encourage a growth mindset among employees around generative AI provide opportunities for continuous ongoing education and development. So keep doing more of this, keep adding to your workshops, keep adding to your micro learning, keep adding certificates and digital badges and so on. Recognize and reward learning achievements. So that can be again, that gamification is good and you can also publicly celebrate those people and my clients definitely do that who make good advances in their generative AI learning. And that integrate that learning into daily work routines. So see how they, people can learn at that daily level from the processes in which they're engaged in on a practical activities. All right. So that's how you'll go into building a learning culture. So thinking about aligning the learning initiatives that we talked about with broader organizational goals and make sure to engage your leadership in promoting a learning culture. I talked about managers being a little bit reluctant to get into generative AI. So you want to address that problem in advance by promoting leadership engagement in that learning culture. Foster a collaborative and really supportive learning environment for your team through having leaders model how they learn and how have a wraparound learning culture around everyone and celebrate success and milestones in people's learning journeys on individual and team level alike. So that's how you want to think about building a learning culture around generative AI. Now, let's go on to talk about effective communication and employee engagement. So you want to have a clear explanation of the generative AI benefits and impacts on individual roles. So I talked about those so benefits. So think about which ones are applicable to your company regularly update folks on generative AI integration progress into your company. Use multiple channels, meetings, emails, intranet, whatever you're using, Slack, obviously, Microsoft Teams messages. So for a mid-sized tech company with which I worked, we had regular town hall meetings discussing generative AI initiatives and Q&A sessions to address employee concerns. And that transparent sharing of generative AI project milestones and outcomes helped build a lot of by an employee engagement in the process where in the Q&A, 
the CEO answered some tough questions, and that was really valuable. So you want to be able and prepared to do that. Address staff concerns and misconceptions. Have open forums for discussing generative AI-related anxieties, like those town halls and Q&A sessions. Provide factual information. You'll have a lot of myths you'll want to counter, and so you'll want to make sure to counter those myths. Early adopter facilitated initiatives will help demonstrate the positive impact of generative AI. So you want to plan out in advance how to have some of those wins, early wins forward. So thinking about early onward, how you have those early wins is really helpful. So original insurance company with which I worked on this topic hosted generai myths and facts sessions for employees, and that was really helpful. And it created an internet portal with generative AI resources and facts customized. We customized those to the company. So I have a template of those that I use for companies in general, and then I customize it to each individual company's needs. And that's what you want to be thinking about, how to customize general templates, FAQs for your company's actual needs. And that helped reduce employee com apprehension, worries about things, and increased their acceptance of generative AI as a tool. How do you get employees involved? So you want to form cross-functional generative AI committees across a number of departments, because you'll definitely have workflows that go across departments. And you want to make sure that generative AI is adopted at similar times across departments that share workflows. Invite employees to make sure that they participate in those pilot programs and think about those early wins. So I talked about early wins already. Think about in your company. What would you do to have early wins? Early wins are a great strategy to get generative AI excitement built up. Encourage feedback on generative AI tools and processes. So get that information. A client case study for is a mid-sized logistics company with which I worked, which established a generai council with representatives across the organization. It piloted generai projects with volunteer employee task forces and integrated feedback to refine how we integrated generative AI into the company as we implemented it. Empower employees, create platforms that they can use to submit ideas and innovations, recognize and reward their contributions as part of their performance evaluations, give some rewards and bonuses, promote a culture of collaboration and shared success. So in a mid-sized high-tech manufacturing company, which we did is we launched an internal innovation hub for generative AI ideas and we rewarded employees for innovation that helped so solve things using generative AI. And we fostered a really collaborative environment for generative AI integration. Encourage supportive environment for experimentation. So that's the psychological safety that I talked about. Again, repeating themes from earlier. Promote a culture that values innovation and experimentation have teams test various generative AI tools and methods and make sure that they know that they don't have to commit to them as they start with them. Allow rooms for failures and learning from those mistakes and provide resources and time for people to experiment. So in the regional professional services firm, what we did is employees received a toolbox with resources for innovation and staff were encouraged to develop and test new ideas and experiment with them. The examples of outcomes for HR of these ideas, I'll give you some examples. There was increased improvement ag algorithms using generative AI, that was really helpful. We had better employee engagement tools, so that was really helpful. And significant increase in innovative HR solutions as a result. So that's the kind of things that you can get. Now, how do you balance autonomy with guidance? You want to set clear goals and expectations for the projects for generative AI and have regular check-ins to monitor progress and provide feedback. Encourage various teams to collaborate and share insights. That's the cross-functional committees. That really helps. Provide continuous training and development opportunities for folks. And some mid-sized tech firm, what we did was we offered a structured training programs alongside independent project work. So that's guidance with autonomy and review sessions to discuss progress and challenges. That was really helpful for folks. We encourage staff to collaborate and share their best practices. 
and we maintain a balance between autonomy and guided support for AI initiatives as a result. All right, so we talked about how to get employees involved, and you want to think about how to do that. But you also want to think about generative AI risks and how to address those. Data privacy and security risks are major issues, so you want to implement good data protection measures, conduct regular security audits and assessments, and have ensured encryption and secure data handling procedures. So I told you about using things like Microsoft's Copilot, which protects the data that you are using. Train employees on data privacy best practices as part of doing so. So European Bank is an example. It had developed an AI-driven customer service tool, and it had to, of course, conduct comprehensive data privacy assessments to comply with GDPR by anonymizing customer data. So that's what resulted in, in, in good compliance with the regulators. So the regulators seeing this were trusting of this technique, this uh, AI-driven customer service tool. And of course, it helped the bank be quite a bit more efficient and use less customer service resources. What about bias? You've heard this a number of times in generative AI algorithms. So you want to make sure to identify and mitigate biases in your generative AI models. If possible, use diverse data sets when you're training the generative AI system on your internal company data and take out whatever data might be potentially biased. So there are services which will do that for you. Regularly review and update generative AI algorithms and make sure to implement fairness and accountability checks for the kind of data that AI produces. But the mid-sized tech company, that's one that was already mentioned before, we developed a toolkit to detect and mitigate bias and implemented HR processes to ensure fairing hiring practices. So we double-checked hiring practices that generative AI used to filter through resumes, for example, by filtering through by humans as well and doing some spot checking. So regularly update models based on fairness assessments, and that's how you'll achieve greater equity in gen AI-driven decisions. Now, thinking about compliance, there are going to be a number of compliance issues and a number of bills are coming through various states. So if you're in California, SB 1047, obviously if you're in Europe, they already passed the law on generative AI. So depends on where you are and you want to be thinking about what's going on in your local context. So stay updated with evolving generative AI regulations. Ensure that legal and compliance teams participate and keep track of generative AI projects and document decision-making processes that use generative AI. Ensure transparency and accountability as part of using generative AI. So here's what a regional healthcare provider did. Developed a generative AI for patient diagnosis and then it engaged legal experts to evaluate healthcare regulations as part of doing so. So we ensured that generative AI decisions were explainable and documentable. And that's what made sure that we successfully complied with HIPAA through data privacy and protections and other standards. Now, something to mention that is going to be something to think about in the long term is long-term risks not something that you'll immediately be able to do something around, but something that you as a socially responsible corporate citizen should be aware of. So we do face potential loss of control of regenerative AI systems. Imagine generative AI getting out in the form of a virus. If somebody creates a generative AI tool as a virus that's constantly evolving, that can do much more damage than the crowd strike accidental bug. So AI can surpass human intelligence and super intelligence, and that can create a lot of problems. If a super intelligent tool is given the goal of maximizing company's bottom line and not necessarily following the laws. So you want to mitigate those long-term risks through implementing and endorsing. Again, not something you can immediately do in your company, but as a socially responsible corporate citizen, endorse and encourage strict oversight and governance frameworks conduct thorough risk assessments and scenario planning, ensure human in the loop oversight for critical decisions, like talking about making money for the company and promote international cooperation on AI safety standards. So thinking about that as being a responsible corporate citizen. All right, what about how to integrate generative AI? 
here are the steps to a comprehensive generative AI adoption strategy as we come to the last section. Assess your current processes, define clear objectives and goals, engage the clear stakeholders and build up a team, develop a roadmap and a timeline, choose the right generative AI tools and partners, evaluate using effective metrics and pursue continuous improvement. So those are the really seven steps that you want to be thinking about for a comprehensive generative AI adoption strategy. Let's talk about the metrics part of it, because I think the other things are going to be more clear and explained by the first half of the presentation. Efficiency metrics are something you'll want to measure. How efficient are you by using generative AI? How much does it improve efficiency? What about employee experience? What's the employee experience like with using generative AI? Performance metrics. What is the performance improvement through using generative AI? One is efficiency, so lower costs, lower input. One is performance. Performance meaning higher performance, higher output from the same resources. Adoption and utilization rates. To what extent are people adopting generative AI? How well are they using it? In a regional financial services firm, we measure time savings in the recruitment and onboarding in terms of HR functions. And of course, there are lots of other things, but I'm talking about HR functions in this sense. Time savings in recruitment and onboarding. And then we track employee satisfaction for regular surveys on a variety of use of generative AI. We evaluated performance improvements using analytics, and we monitor generative AI tool adoption rates and user feedback. And we made changes as a result of this monitoring, of course, Monitoring just by itself is not useful. You want to make changes as a result of your monitoring. And you want to make that continuous improvement. So I talked about making changes. Collect and analyze feedback and see, based on the feedback, what you can do differently and better. Have iterative improvements. So improve something, collect more feedback, collect more data, collect more survey information, information about performance, efficiency, and so on. Have clear reporting and accountability mechanisms for generative AI tools and have training and development, of course, for generative AI, continuous training. So going back to the second part on a learning culture. So at a mid-sized tech company, we corrected regular feedback from staff and employees on how they're using generative AI, on performance, on efficiency, and we made iterative improvements, small improvements over time to generative AI-driven processes in a variety of areas. We reported the progress and outcomes to stakeholders, and we got their reports on what they felt was the status of generative AI and what they needed. And that's when we provided ongoing training and development for staff. So that's how you provide continuous improvement based on metrics. And so the generative AI adoption, we talked about the seven steps, then about improvement, then about the metrics, and then about continuous improvement based on metrics. And so here are the key takeaways for mastering generative AI adoption as we come to the end of the presentation. The importance of generative AI for HR, we talked about that. So there's a lot of benefits for HR, but you need to make sure to address those cognitive biases, the empathy gap, the status quo bias, the loss aversion, using behavioral science-based strategies. Foster a learning culture. We talked about a number of techniques to foster a learning culture and make sure that you provide appropriate training, peer mentoring, micro learning, gamification, tracking later, uh, tracking learning for data analytics, gain employee engagement and buying, address their concerns about job loss, make sure to have transparency, town halls, get their feedback, get information to them, have anonymous surveys, mitigate risks and ensure compliance. That is going to be really important for you I have a number of clients in the financial industry, as I mentioned, in the insurance industry, especially in those industries, I've seen risk addressing risks and compliance is very important. And develop a comprehensive generative AI adoption strategy, which uses the seven steps that we discussed. So tracking progress with key metrics and continuous improvement as part of that adoption strategy. All right. As you start integrating, what my clients find is that it works best to start with small and manageable generative AI projects. And that short-term wins that you use for those small manageable projects, that's what will help inspire your team to unlock the real full potential of generative AI. All right, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Now, 
make sure to get the additional resources. It's going to be in the resources section. So make sure to go there and click on that. Or you can put in your URL, the link that you see below my name, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. And you'll get a copy of a link to slides. So we don't have the formal PDF of the slides. We have a link to the slides and to the Prezi. Then you'll get a copy of my best-selling book, Chat GPT for Thought Leaders and Content Creators, Unlocking the Potential of Generative AI for Innovative and Effective Content Creation. And I will be happy to give anyone who is interested a free coaching session for integrating these strategies into your work, a half-hour coaching strategies for you and your team members for integrating these strategies into your work. So again, a link to slides, a copy of my best-selling books, and if you're interested, a free coaching session. Go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. And it's also going to be in the resources section. So again, get those resources. And thank you again for paying attention to the presentation. And now we'll transition to the Q&A. And what are some of the challenges you've seen in creating a learning culture around Gen AI, and how can these challenges be addressed? So what I've seen is that creating a learning culture can be difficult when you don't get employee engagement and buy-in. And so that's what you want to address first. You want to make sure to think about, OK, when you are intending to create a learning culture, how can you address people's fears, address that empathy gap, address that loss aversion, address that status quo bias? So that's the main challenge. The tactics that I outlined should be really helpful for actually doing it. So that it's going to be part free. But you want to think about part, using part free, so employee engagement and buy-in, before launching into a learning culture. All right, thank you. We'll get to more questions in just a moment. Here's the information on the PDC you earned today toward Term CP and SCP recertification. You can claim your credit by using the number 24-FG5RC. Again, that number is 24-FG5RC. Regardless of the type of recertification you have, you must keep track of the Sherm webcast you've watched and keep a reliable record on your end. All right, our next question from a viewer. How can organizations address employee fears about job displacement due to generative AI adoption? So what you want to do is be honest and transparent. Some employees might well have to leave. So again, one company that I worked with, they got rid of 30% of their accounting uh, task force. A number of companies that I worked with got rid of a number of programmers because of coding done by generative AI. And of course, marketers through who were previously writing articles, you don't need as many of those. And some people will be let go. And you know what? It's just a reality. If you pretend that it won't happen, people will not trust you. So what you want to do is be honest and transparent. A good tactic is to say that you will stop hiring you will not fire people as you assess your generative ai processes integration into various systems if you can truly keep that promise but the crucial thing is to be transparent and honest and people will accept that when you tell them that hey the reality is if you learn how to use generative ai we will not let you go because the you need people who use generative ai effectively so if you can master these skills, we will not let you go. So that's another strategy that I've seen work really well. All right, we have time for one more question. And I think some people need that PDC number again. It's in your slides window. You can bring up the slides window by clicking the uh, projector image on the, the button at the bottom of your screen. So that number is 24-FG5RC, FG5RC. All right, our next question and final question, what are some practical steps for developing a comprehensive generative AI adoption strategy tailored to an organization's unique needs? 
So I talked about the seven steps that you'll want to use. What I really encourage you to do is to start by seeing what your early generative AI adopters are already doing. So again, get information from them, see what they are doing. And what they are doing is what will be helpful for you to understand and know that, hey, if that's what they're doing, those are probably the things that are the winning projects. So I mentioned that the first thing that you want to think about is how to have short-term wins with generative AI. So a really easy way to do so is to get information from the 10, 20, 30% of your staff who are already using generative AI and spreading it to everyone else. Have them as peer mentors. That's why that's the first part of the learning culture. So that is a really easy step that will get people excited and that will get a lot of early wins out. And that will help you provide motivation engagement for more deep generative AI integration. All right. Thank you. We're coming to the end of this program. We've got about 90 seconds before the program window closes. So if you haven't downloaded the program slides or your certificate for viewing today's program, you can do that now. You do not need certificates to claim your recertification credit, but those certificates can come in handy in the likely event that you were audited. If you're missing some or all of your certificates from Showmobcasts, don't worry. We can provide verification. You just need to let us know which Showmobcast you need certificates for. If you're audited, please send that list to the Sherm customer support team at Sherm at Sherm.org. When the program window closes in just a moment, an evaluation, evaluation form will pop up. We hope you take a few moments to fill that out. It helps us assess this program and plan for future events. Before we sign off, we want to thank our presenter, Dr. Gleb Sapersky, for the information he provided today. And we also want to thank everyone tuning in for being with us and for choosing Churn for HR webcasts. That concludes this program.